The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the diversity webinar, a collaboration between Black Women Orthopedic Surgeons and the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society to discuss Executive Order 13950, Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping. We would like to extend a special thank you to AOS for allowing us to utilize their webinar platform to host this session. I'd like to run through a few housekeeping items before we kick off the meeting. Please make sure your speakers are turned on and that the volume is turned up. For technical assistance, you can reference the help tab at any time. If you have any technical difficulties, your best bet is to close all of your browsers and log back in the same way you did the first time. If you experience any buffering issues, please refresh your browser. We are recording this webinar and will provide the recording online within the week. You are encouraged to ask questions. Please type your questions in the question box in the navigation column at the right of your screen. The questions will be addressed at the end of tonight's session. I'll now turn the program over to our moderator, RJOS President, Dr. Don Laporte, to begin tonight's webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening and welcome. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Don Laporte and I'm the president of the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society and also a hand surgeon and residency program director and vice chair at Johns Hopkins. The Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society's mission is to promote professional development of and for women in orthopedic surgery throughout all stages of their careers. Our JOS aims to represent and encourage all women in orthopedics. However, we recognize that we have not always been consistent and have taken some missteps in the past. We have not always been as welcoming and inclusive or supportive as we should be or as we want to be. We acknowledge and own these mistakes and are committed to real change moving forward. The board has recently revised the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society strategic plan and has added diversity and inclusion at the top of the list. We are reading and educating ourselves. We are having difficult conversations and we are trying to learn to be good allies this year, we have partnered with the J. Robert Gladden Orthopedic Society and the American Association for Latino Orthopedic Surgeons as Ortho United. We are honored to partner tonight with the Black Women Orthopedic Surgeons Organization for this webinar. The Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society is committed to and excited about increasing diversity and inclusion in orthopedic surgery. Inasmuch, we have selected this major societal and professional concept as the theme of our annual meeting in 2021. We are pleased to have Dr. Peggy McIntosh as our distinguished keynote speaker for the meeting in August of 2021. We plan to have a series of events leading up to the annual meeting, beginning with this webinar and focus on the importance of education and action moving forward. We know that this will require some hard discussions over time, but we are dedicated to committing the energy and resources to change diversity in orthopedics. We'll start the dialogue tonight with a discussion of the executive order 13950, combating race and sex stereotyping. We are honored and privileged to have an outstanding panel tonight, made up of Dr. Ida Brown, President of the DWOS and Foot and Ankle Surgeon, Dr. Shasta Henderson, Orthopedic Trauma Surgeon, Dr. Bonnie Mason, Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion for the ACGME and Founder of Nth Dimension, Dr. Mary O'Connor, Arthroplasty Surgeon, former RJOS President and Chair of Movement is Life, and Dr. Julie Samora, Hand and Upper Extremity Surgeon and Vice President of the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society. Shortly, I will introduce Dr. Ida Brown to tell us about the BWOS, and then she will be followed by Dr. Bonnie Mason talking about the implications of the executive order, and Dr. Mary O'Connor will follow talking about the executive order and its impact on healthcare disparities. Our panel discussion will follow addressing some of the questions, thoughtful and challenging, that have been posed by the webinar registrants and we'll open to some live questions as well. 
in order to keep the dialogue on diversity moving forward, our 2021 calendar will start off in January with a book club discussion on white fragility. And then in February, we'll have a webinar on implicit bias in medicine and April, a webinar on transgender issues in orthopedics. I hope that you can join us for these sessions and help our JOS promote professional development of and for women in orthopedic surgery throughout all stages of their career. Our JOS is dedicated to welcoming and promoting all women in orthopedics. I hope that y'all join us. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ida Brown to tell us about the BWOS. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Don Laporte. This is the first collaboration between the Black Women Orthopedic Surgeons, BWOS, and the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society. The BWS mission is to support and empower Black women orthopedic surgeons through mentoring, activism, and education while advocating for health equity. Since our first meeting in July, BWS has established several programs to fulfill that mission. On mentoring and education, 25 Black female orthopedic residents participated in our OITE reviews, which were held with Nth Dimensions. We are also supporting Nth Dimensions' new initiative, the Strategic Mentoring Program, and look forward to that. Our activism continues tonight with this panel discussion on the outgoing administration's controversial Executive Order 13950, which is ironically called the Executive Order on Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping. It actually defunds training and eliminates decades of work to address racial inequities. Last month, BWS used our network to hand deliver our BWS statement opposing the executive order to Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Why did we do all of this? Great question. Why did 78 Black women come together this July? We came together because professionally, we have not been included. Think about it. Currently this year, 2020, there are approximately 25 Black women out of 3,300 uh, 3, orthopedic surgery residents nationally. Black women make up less than 1% of practicing orthopedic surgeons in the US. BWS met this summer as we were drawn together by the current climate, a global pandemic, a worsening political divide and racial unrest. So for BWS, diversity and inclusion is more important than just orthopedics. Diversity, equity and inclusion is much bigger than that. In healthcare, especially in our field, there remains work to, be, to do tackling conscious and unconscious bias, as well as structural racism. Diversity and inclusion is important to all of us as a country. This is important because I am the mother of a nine-year-old Black son. I am the daughter and sister to Black men, and I am enraged by our vulnerability as people of color. I am enraged because I, despite my training and occupation, cannot protect my family and loved ones from the violence and normalization of systemic racism. So that is why we have to have these tough discussions, these hard conversations to make us exist in a more just and equitable society. And that's because we all care about the, this country and the future of our country and BWS especially cares about the future of our country. So that's why we're here and thank you all for coming tonight. And I really look forward to this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mason. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Bonnie Simpson Mason, orthopedic surgeon by training, and I am now the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Accreditation Council for Gra Graduate Medical Education, better known as the ACGME. It is certainly my honor and a, and a privilege to be here with um, my colleagues um, and certainly um, longtime friend, Don Laporte, Dr. Don Laporte, um, longtime mentor, Dr. Mary O'Connor, and um, uh, supporter in, of Nth Dimensions, Dr. Julie Samora, and certainly my mentees as they rise into 
leadership, Dr. Ida Brown and Dr. Shasta Henderson. So this is what ma makes mentors feel really, really, you know, really, really good. Um, and the fact that we could convene in this situation um, to have the hard conversations, as Dr. Brown um, mentioned, is, is critically important. Um, so the ACGME is, you know, I'm really proud to be part of an organization that has seen fit to push the agenda of diversity, equity, and inclusion, wherein equity um, does not um, mean the same as equal the provision of resources, but equitable provision of resources requires that all are provided with resources they need to be uh, successful in the environment and in the work that they are there to do. So diversity and equity are necessary components of inclusion, hence we have added equity to our name, the title of our office, and to the title of our office officers as well. Um, so it's really important that we provide some context um, and following the AAMC's response to um, executive to the executive order 13950 issued on September 22nd, the ACGME, by way of our president and CEO, Dr. Tom Nasca, um, drafted by our office, our Department of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, indicated in no uncertain terms that we were not in support of this executive order. Um, and specifically, um, our position, the ACGME's position on the executive order um, stated quite clearly that it promotes training of employees to create an inclusive environment by avoiding race and sex stereotyping, but the intent was subverted by defining the divisive concepts. So if you take just a couple of seconds to look at those divisive concepts within um, the executive order, um, you'll, you will come to see that some of the key issues regarding all entities that um, work to inform, raise awareness, and provide education and training around issues based, in, based on sex or stereotyping, um, which is described as describing character traits, values, moral and ethical codes, privileges, status, or beliefs to, to a race or a sex um, as scapegoating uh, these individuals by assigning fault or blame or bias, that these are some of the key terms that have been um, essentially uh, prohibited as training concepts. So um, inherently, this um, type of language Number one, although it is not um, specific in some areas, it can globally blanket the work that any organization, association, or group has endeavored in to um, address the issues, the biases, the discriminatory acts, um, and, the, and the resulting disparities that we now see from our patients as a result of stating that these are the types of topics that cannot be discussed. Um, for, um, education cannot be provided around more training. So specifically, our concern from the ACGME was that the institutions and programs that would be impacted, as in our statement um, that we have published on our website, includes um, federally funded sponsoring institutions that house residency and fellowship training programs in graduate medical education. This extends to federally funded healthcare institutions and their educational and or community programs, such as the VA, the US military, FQHCs, the Indian Health Service, and the National Institutes of Health. It also will impact uh, federally funded um, pathway programs for um, healthcare workers, including uh, physicians, but those that are supported by HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration. We also know, as, as published in an, a recent article in Diversity, Inc., that this um, executive order can also impact negatively our um, minority-serving institutions, our HBCUs, um, across the country based on the language that is so globally blanketing the, mis the mentioning of uh, issues around race. And that is the foundation of why historically Black colleges and universities were uh, were founded um, to account for the disparity in educational provision, um, you know, that is that is centuries old. So in our mind um, and in the mind of the AAMC and that of the um, American Medical Association as well, 
Um, this executive order is not one that we will stand behind, but we will continue to enforce our common program requirements for um, residency and fellowship training programs that require um, systematic and ongoing um, uh, recruitment and retention efforts of, of a diverse workforce, those that require that program directors and institutions provide learning environments that are civil, professional, equitable, and respectful of all free of discrimination, mistreatment, and harassment, and those that um, require that programs um, allow for environments that where um, residents feel safe to um, lodge complaints free from retaliation. So we are um, extremely um, concerned about this particular executive order and the blanket negative effects that it can have on our ability to train um, our future physicians, our faculty's ability to do their work, and the ultimate impact on um, health disparities that we know already exist, and this could work to exacerbate them in um, significant, significant ways. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any comments or questions at the end of the talk. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. O'Connor. Thank you, Dawn. Um, you know, there's so much nuance that we have um, about our work. And, and when I actually read uh, the executive order, I was trying to approach it from a perspective of, of um, trying to see the positive in it, or maybe maybe like giving them the benefit of the doubt about the executive order. And I still struggled with some areas because as Dr. Mason has mentioned, from my perspective, one of the fundamental problems is that when someone puts out an order like this, that basically restricts the freedom of discussion and the freedom of ideas and the transparency because they're saying you can only talk about diversity and inclusion in this way, which is kind of what the executive order does in my mind, then it, it hampers the freedom of speech. So I'll just start with kind of that <clears throat> civil libertarian approach to begin with. Um, but it, and as I was trying to read about what others have said about it, um, there was one, and I, and I think um, Dr. Laporte may have shared this, uh, there was one article that was posted that where they went to the director of one of these, the federal programs, who stated that unconscious bias training is perfectly fine as long as the training teaches that everyone based on the human condition has unconscious biases. Okay, so far so good. We all have unconscious biases and we do feel that, I mean, I certainly believe that we need training about conscious and unconscious bias. <clears throat> but here's where, the, the, from my perspective, the problem is. As long as that training does not specifically call out a particular race, national origin, or sex as being inherently biased. So this is like uh, almost, I wanna say like splitting hairs, right? I mean, how, and it, it, how can you say that we don't collectively have inherent bias when we know we have bias as individuals? Because the individuals make up the collective. So of course there's collective bias, just like there's individual bias. And we see that played out in our health systems. I mean, we could substitute different words for race, ethnicity, or gender. We could put health systems or hospital administrators as opposed to physicians, or we could put nurses. We could, I mean, we, you can put any group and, and substitute that because all of us collectively come as members of, of a certain tribe, and we're all usually members of multiple tribes, right, with our biases based on our experience and our perspective. I'll give you an example. So I was reading something today about, I don't know, it was somewhere in the, out in the Midwest where the pandemic is worse, 
and there were nurses that were coming out and saying about how terrible the care was and they're understaffed and these people are dying. And there was only one patient with COVID who made it out of the ICU alive. And it was a woman who was the wife of a physician at that hospital. And these nurses were talking about how that patient received different care, that they did everything they possibly could for that woman, and they didn't do all of those same measures for other patients. And that this nurse felt this was unfair and that there was, in, that I'm putting now words, I'm translating my, my interpretation of, of her assessment was there was inherent bias because she was the wife of a physician so so she her life mattered more her life was of greater value so we we don't want to have that in our healthcare system right i mean none of us want that i mean we want everyone to be to be treated to the best of our abilities so if we're not going to have a culture where we can call out situations where our unconscious bias comes into play and we're harming other patients as a result of that, then we cannot move towards equity. So I, I think this executive order has some very fundamental flaws and I fully expect that it will you know, be reversed um, shortly. So I think, Don, that's, I mean, I'm ha we can have more conversation and answer questions about it, but the fundamental problem is it's muzzling the way that we can have conversations about diversity, inclusion, and equity, and that should concern all of us. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. And I am very hopeful that will be overturned soon with the new administration. Um, there are no questions um, in the question box. So please, if anyone has questions for Dr. O'Connor, Dr. Mason, um, send them in. Uh, but I think we'll transition uh, to the panel and maybe start with some uh, related questions. And thank you very much for that discussion. Um, so maybe as a first question what uh, these are questions that were sent in by folks who registered what concrete steps can we take to mobilize those in power to value diversity in orthopedics um dr henderson do you want to um comment on that okay thank you um I think that there's a lot of concrete data that we have, and I think that speaking objectively is important uh, sometimes. Um, and so there's a lot of concrete data that we have um, that shows that people that are cared for by practitioners that look like them um, receive better care and respond differently to that care. Um, and so I think having data such as that may mobilize people um, who care about their patients' outcomes um, whether that be individually or as a health system um, and, and draw their interest into having a diverse uh, workforce that looks more like the, the population that they care for. Um, like a, a great book called Seeing Patients written by Augustus White, who, who a lot of on the panel know very well, talked about unconscious bias um, and uh, how to provide culturally appropriate care. Um, and there are some standards based upon that, that that were put forth by like the National Committee for Quality Assurance. And there's these standards of, of how we should be practicing. Um, and um, and so I think just looking into things such as that are, are ways that we can get people interested in, in this topic and, and have productive conversations. Thank you. That's great. Um, anyone else want to weigh in on that? I think moving towards a culture of equity is the goal that uh, we are encouraging all of our training programs to move towards, starting from the leadership down. We're taking a reverse ideation approach to um, our educational um, uh, approach to DEI because we want our leadership to engage in the process um, by starting with um, data metrics. Um, aggregating data, not just around the diversity demographics within our institution, 
but looking at our recruitment and retention efforts, actually looking at our attrition rates, which we know are disparately weighed against those who are either Black or Latinx, especially in the field of orthopedic surgery. So data acquisition and analysis um, is the first step because we can't change what we don't measure. So we're encouraging all of our programs and our institutions to take a, and our associations to take a hard look from the um, uh, from the ABOS to the AAOS all the way to our individual institutions and programs to look at our uh, matriculation data when it comes to diverse um, um, candidates who are recruited, how many are return, retained and how many actually move through to board certification um, and then those who don't move through to board certification and why. So this is just one of the steps, um, looking at the data, analyzing the data and having a uh, hard questions, asking the hard questions about the data is, is a critical first step um, because what, what we've learned is that um, not having the data or not collecting the data is also data. It can be, it, that's a critical, critical um, awakening and awareness that we, I think all leaders, all those in leadership can come to. That's great. On that same note, are there mechanisms in place that you've seen either at your institution or with colleagues that you've worked with to help uh, recruit and retain women or underrepresented groups? Well, Don, if I could, um, before, before you go on to that next question, I want to take a, I'd like us all to take a step back. And if we think about why we have such inequity. I, I've thought about this a lot, particularly in my work with Movement is Life. And it, to me, it comes down to poverty. And when we look at the impact that we as orthopedic surgeons have on patients, and I completely agree with Dr. Henderson that we absolutely need more diversity and inclusion in our profession because patients are more comfortable when they see a doctor or a healthcare provider who looks like them. It's, it's just that simple. But when we go further upstream and we say, why is that patient so inherently ill? Why are they in such poor health? It's because they live in a food desert. It's because they're in a neighborhood where the air is bad. It's not safe for them to walk outside. So they develop diabetes, hypertension, obesity, arthritis, all this stuff. And, and the common factor that links these patients, irrespective of race, gender, or ethnicity, because we have a lot of sick Caucasian people in, in Appalachia, for example, and a, a lot of areas of the country, it's poverty. And so poverty is this unifying theme that destroys people's health because they don't have access to adequate resources. And if there was one thing I could do, if I had like, I was queen of the universe and I could wave a magic wand to improve health, I would actually focus on poverty because if we can lift people out of poverty, then we, have, we can improve their health in, in ways that we as individual uh, physicians or providers can't and they could avoid seeing us because maybe they'll never get that maybe they'll never get that sick um and and it and it reflects how social determinants of health and individual behaviors individual health behaviors in particular are are more dominant in terms of influencing a person's health and well-being than the direct medical care that we provide which actually only makes up you know, about 11% of what contributes to someone's health and well-being. So, so how do we need to engage? I think we need to become more engaged in how do we help our communities and improve the, the, the safety and food security and how do we try and work to bring good jobs to communities? Because once we lift the communities up in that way, a rising tide lifts all boats. So we thinking of health and our role in health more broadly 
than just our role as individual orthopedic surgeons, I think is important. So I'll, I'll stop there because we, we, we end up even, I know we're important, but we're really this smaller segment of what really creates health and well-being in populations. And we need to start embracing that and using our voice as physicians because we are still a respected group in this country. I mean, people in general trust doctors to say this isn't okay and we have to put more effort into not just medical access, and of course that's important, and social determinants of health and you know structural racism and systemic discrimination, all these things matter. But we also have to think of it through the lens of communities where people live. I could keep I, going, I'm going to let others comment. No, I, I certainly would like to add, while the health care, uh, provision of health care makes up about 12% of the rationale or reason why we have the disparities, I mean, part of the reason we're having this discussion tonight is we have to be, start having the hard conversations around systemic racism as one of the key drivers as to why the social determinants of health even exist why we've had to discuss food deserts of uh, food insecurity, um, you know, disparate access to, to health care. And then we see just blanket disparities in outcomes, even as, you know, stated in the Institutes of Medicine uh, report back in 2000, that, you know, across all parameters of health and disease, Black Americans continue to have worse health outcomes and comorbidities compared to white Americans. And, you know, th those data have not changed. As a matter of fact, they, they were worsened. Um, and to the extent that, you know, socioeconomic status aside, um, you know, and, and Mary, you and I talked about this um, data when it comes to the survival of, of Black babies. You know, Black babies are more likely to survive if they have a Black pediatrician by fivefold. It's, it's, I, I think that is the, the, the number. That's just not okay. Right. That's just not okay that despite socioeconomic status of that mother, that black mortality for for black women giving birth is still exacerbated. So um, I think we have several layers of disparities to review. Um, but I think one of the goals of this particular conversation is to start to elevate systemic racism also as a as a um, one of the um, conduits for con conversation that we necessarily have not been willing to have, not just in orthopedics, but in medicine itself. Dr. Mason, can I ask you a question about that? So um, I have been serving as deputy editor for AOS Now, and one of the articles I had written was talking about systemic racism. And I had a letter to the editor that said, systemic racism doesn't exist in this country, and gave several examples from Black researchers that said systemic racism doesn't exist in America. What do you say to that person that says to you systemic racism doesn't exist when you know from data that it does exist? What's your what's your elevator speech to that individual? My elevator speech is that it's my lived experience on a day to day basis that systemic racism exists, including people barging in on Zoom calls um, using the N word. You know, our lived experience on a day to day basis, even in the rendering and in, in rendering of care, but even in the efforts to try to become physicians, that our lived experience for us um, is very real. And then that's one of the key um, tools of racism is to undervalue or devalue the lived experience of others. You know, what we experience, um, as, as indicated once again by our um, data and metrics, is that um, bias, both unconscious and conscious, is, uh, is alive and well. And so we can continue to debate about it, but when we have disparities in healthcare, disparities in nutrition of our black residents and brown residents in every specialty at the GME level, where we have more black and brown residents that are dismissed versus those of white residents, at some point we have to acknowledge what is happening. We have to accept that systemic racism is real, it's not made up, it's been going on for 400 years. And we are starting to see the outcomes of these disparities as witnessed by COVID. In Chicago, 
out of the first 100 people who passed in Chicago due to COVID, 70 were Black. And that disparity continues to play out in an exacerbated rate across all minoritized populations across the U.S. We can, as much data as they want to say they have, we have data and a lived experience. You know, to the extent that my mother had a two-level lumbar uh, uh, foraminotomy and went without pain medication all night because her nurse said that she didn't ask for it after being under general anesthesia versus coming in and providing pain uh, relief to a 72-year-old Black woman who had back surgery and who then had to sit in her urine for the next day. We can't, for the next few hours in the next day, we can't say that it doesn't exist. It's our lived experience. And so I know that we like to make this an academic and scholarly debate, as Dr. Henderson stated, it's important, and that we can also speak to it from our lived experience as part of the conversation we want to lift up. It's uncomfortable. These are not discussions people want to have. These are sensitive subjects. But this comfort is the lived experience that Black women in orthopedics, Blacks in America experience on a daily basis. And. Um... To piggyback on what you're saying, uh, Dr. Mason, it, it, it negates our experience as Black women, as people of color, to state that there is no systemic racism. It negates, our, it, it negates the experience of Dr. Mason's mom. It negates the experience of my father, who recently was in an ER here in um, New York. And here you have a, seven, a nearly 70-year-old man that is asked if he's carrying a weapon after a fall. Um, and that definitely impacts the administration of care. So uh, I, it, it actually is troublesome when people negate um, racism, uh, systemic racism, that is a position of privilege to come from, because that means that you are not impacted by it. And really, that goes to Ibram Kendi, and either you are racist or you are anti-racist. So either you are fighting against systemic racism or you in some form complacent with, with that, the, the system. So it's, it is uncomfortable. It is difficult. And this is one of the reasons why we've started these discussions today and why we have the work that our JLS is doing moving forward. You know, Dawn, I want to comment about some of the challenges that we face when we're talking about measurements and i agree with dr mason if you you have to measure it or you can't change it you we need data so um there was an article that i read where there's a health system that is now going to reward or link financial bonuses to hos to hospital administrators or the health system administrators with infant mortality and in particular uh, infant mortality and maternal mortality for uh, women and babies of color. So on the, uh, I, I found myself a little, uh, I don't, uh, thinking about that, and I thought, well, is that a good thing that that a health system is doing that? And maybe it is because it purposefully is highlighting this mortality gap um, with African-American women and their babies compared to Caucasian women and their babies. And, and that absolutely should be looked at and, and all, you know, and, and, pro, and, and try to, uh, an improvement's made. But I also think that it calls out what exactly there, what exactly can health systems or administrators do on the upstream part of this, right? Yes, could they improve the care that they provide these women once they enter the doors of that hospital? I'm sure they could. I mean, there's always opportunity for us to do better, but there's even more opportunity if you're going to have, if you have such difference in outcomes. But again, it gets back to, that's not the only thing that's impacting the outcome for these women and their babies. And that's where if we're going to be people that are members of, of the larger society, we are the healthcare system of our society, then we have to think of health more broadly. And again, going up more upstream 
about how we're going to impact um, individuals so that they are healthier and the disparities are lessened. So to get back to your point about what can you do with health systems, do you link financial bonus to the people that work there with clinical outcomes? We have seen this linkage occurring with value-based payment models, right, where the link is on financial, a financial performance as opposed to a clinical metric um, necessarily. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, I don't fundamentally like linking those kinds of uh, linking financial incentives to those things because most people and the studies support this are going to align with a personal value. I mean, make this something that we agree matters to us as healthcare providers that we're going to work to make this outcome better and we can take pride in that. And and don't don't I'm not going to do it just because of the money. I don't know. There, to, to me it's a little um uh, it's not aligning the values that we should bring to our patients and our work with the outcome if it's so directly tied to the money. And maybe others feel differently because the question is really how do we incentivize healthcare systems to, to produce more equitable care? I'm going to turn it a little bit and ask um, if there's any suggestions for how do you start the conversation with your patients about concerns of how their care will be impacted by race? Um, do, you, do you broach that? Um, how do you do that without being too uncomfortable? Um, I guess I'll tackle that. I, I, I do trauma and so uh, it's well known that there's uh, a large influence of social determinants of health on, on how patients do and whether that be uh, sex, gender, race, um, sexual orientation, uh, occupation, uh, education level. Um, and so I have a conversation uh, about uh, patient goals and that's how I start um, the conversation. Um, I have a conversation about their experience, you know, in the operating room and in the hospital. Um, and uh, I think that at least wh where I practice, I'm uniquely positioned uh, as, as the only surgeon that looks like me. Um, and, uh, and so maybe I feel better equipped to have these kinds of conversations um, with, with my patients. But I think that uh, ignoring them um, and acting as if, uh, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, total joint patients that are, that, that are of uh, color uh, routinely do, do poor um, and seek care uh, less rarely and when their disease is more progressed, uh, we're probably doing our patients a disservice by doing that. And so I think just having an open conversation about their goals, um, how, what their experiences have been in the past, um, and hearing what they have to say can kind of be a good place to start. Thank you, that's great. Um, moving um, to sort of a different area of question, there's uh, somebody said, after being in practice for 22 years, our numbers are still low, meaning, uh, just women and orthopedics in general. So how do we change that moving forward, that level of diversity? Um, maybe Dr. Samora. Uh, so yeah, the numbers are still low. I mean, as it was said earlier on this webinar, you know, women are 6% practicing surgeons. Um, African-American women are 1%. You know, just general African-American surgeons of all genders is 2%. Latinx is 2%. Um, and there was a recent article that just came out of um, JAMA Surgery that looked only at gender diversity, did not look at racial ethnic diversity. And they said, if we kept the status quo, it would take orthopedics 138 years to reach equity in terms of gender um, equity, which to me is baffling, which you know that those numbers are gonna be worse for racial ethnic diversity. Um, and so it really comes down to a pipeline problem. We have a pipeline problem. We are, we are losing out on people at the early stages. Um, and you know, Dr. Mason has shown very, very effectively that if you are able to participate in a program like Nth Dimensions, your chance of actually applying to orthopedics is much higher. You know, Dr. O'Connor has shown that if you are a woman, you need to see women doing the things that you're considering, otherwise you don't consider them. 
Um, Dr. Elisa Latanza has talked about how her PERI initiative has been very effective in increasing matching rates into orthopedics. These pipeline programs work, mentorship works. So we need to continue to support these programs. I mean, Nth Dimensions is not cheap. So it's, it's you know, they can only reach so many people. We wanna reach everybody, uh, which, you know, is not gonna happen today, but maybe maybe in five, 10 years, we can reach everybody. Um, PERI initiatives work. So trying to really support these pipeline programs and then mentoring and, and, and understanding that maybe not every mentor is gonna have someone that looks like them. Uh, the vast majority of our practicing surgeons are, are Caucasian males. And so unfortunately those mentors are gonna have to be in the form of Caucasian males too. But if you're in a position where you are an underrepresented individual like everyone on this panel, um, it's our job to mentor as many people as we can. Thank you. That's fantastic. And then Dr. Mason, maybe do you want to weigh in also, what have you found to be um, really important features of a pipeline program like Ms. Dimension to help these uh, students succeed? Um, well, we're certainly, and I'd like to offer to the entire audience that we're um, moving towards a language um, that's suggestive, not even suggestive, we're replacing pipeline with pathway programs, physician pathway programs, out of respect to our indigenous populations here in the U.S., where the, the mm -hmm. concepts of pipelines are inherently traumatic um, and, uh, and negative in nature. So in terms of our physician pathway programs, it's really been the longitudinal development that we've been able to um, employ in the um, uh, pathway program um, and curriculum at Nth Dimensions. And what we found is that, you know, we're at we're sitting at numbers where we're right around 100 um, physicians that are now orthopedic surgeons who matriculated and successfully matched. So these individuals are either in residency or they're they are in practice. And what we found to your um, point, Julie, is that you know women are 45 times more likely to apply to orthopedic surgery residency um, once they uh, uh, matriculated through um, our longitudinal program. But that's over a four-year course of professional development support and academic resource provision, along with keying them into key network, um, <clears throat> networking opportunities and providing standardized test support. Um, and African-Americans are 15 times, or I should say underrepresented in medicine, students are 15 times more likely to apply to orthopedics. Um, and when our outcomes have shown, and it works for women as well, that you know, um, uh, oh, I think it's close to 40% of our women I mean, of our graduates who match our women, and 40% of those um, graduates who are interventional scholars are, are white women. And so the remainder are underrepresented in medicine. So we see that our program works across all um, races and ethnicities in terms of gender, but we have to be able, to your point, be able to reach more people. And yes, it's expensive, but over time, the cost that we are um, uh, decreasing in terms of healthcare disparities and the numbers, including Dr. Shasta Henderson, um, who was an interventional scholar in 2010 studying under Richard Grant, who was not a black female orthopedic surgeon, but a black male um, champion for black women um, as mentors, um, including one of my mentors as well. These are the types of programs that um, have proven to be successful and can be successful in, in the future with um, greater ex expansion and sustainability in mind. That's fantastic. That's a perfect segue to ask Dr. Henderson, um, how do you seek mentorship from someone who doesn't look like you or doesn't necessarily share your life experience? I think you lead with interest in what you know they're they're performing and what they do. I think everybody likes to hear, oh, you, you know, your research is interesting, and this is what I thought about it, or uh, you know, I really found this interesting about this case. And I think that we have probably have a lot of commonality uh, in that respect. If you're looking for a mentor in orthopedic surgery and you're talking to an orthopedic surgeon, I'm sure that there's a lot of common ground. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about you know social activities with my mentors. I was really focused on someone that I thought was had a vested interest in me um, and interested in, in me excelling in the field. Um, and, and those people looked different. You know, there, there wasn't a, a common, there weren't carbon copies of each other. Um, and I think that you can have mentors that serve different purposes. And so if you have certain questions that you feel only comfortable asking uh, a group of people, you can reach out to organizations like RJOS or BWOS and, and ask those kinds of questions to them. Or if you wanna ask a question about, you know, um, how do I excel and, and become, um, you know, a professional, not only as a surgeon, but 
um, in the business sphere or, or do something like move in his life, someone like Mary O'Connor would be someone to talk to, right? And, um, and so I think that you don't necessarily need to get everything from one person um, and just you know uh, try to develop relationships along the road. I wanted to add my strongest um, or my, my longest running mentor is actually a white woman, uh, Joe Hannafin. I met her back when I was in high school um, and she was the first orthopedic surgeon that I met um, and saw in the operating room. And from that moment, I was, I was uh, I hooked to the field. So she has been a very strong advocate of my career moving forward. And so, yes, I would say that you need to find a mentor who matches your interests. And that does not necessarily need to be someone who is a black woman. It does not have to be someone who is a black man. It has to be someone who values you and values your experience and um, that you have a shared interest in the field. So if, if we were only able to be mentored and sponsored by those that look like us, um, we, we would lack many mentors and sponsors. So it's, it's important for each of us, um, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, to work hard at eliminating some of the biases that may hinder our ability to help those coming behind us. Well, and, and I think what you're talking about is allyship too, right? So everyone can serve as an ally for um, members of their community. You know, I had a white male serve as an ally for me when I was a general surgery intern when a patient said he didn't want me to be his physician. And that ally, the chief resident on the service at the time said, she is your physician, she is part of our team, she is well-trained. And if you do not want her seeing you as, as your physician, you're welcome to seek your care somewhere else. That speaks to me 25 years later because the, you know he demonstrated not just to me but to the patient but to our team as well how we as physicians can serve as allies for our our um, our colleagues even if they don't look like us and so I would like to empower everyone to take up um, that particular uh, position in either um, pursuing allyship training bystander training upstander training all the renditions of the same type of work we would like to see members of our community, um, especially in orthopedics, engage in. Because certainly most of us were probably one of the few or only women in our training programs. And it was our, you know, many of our male colleagues that stood in the gap and, um, you know, partnered with us in our endeavor to become orthopedic surgeons. So I would, you know, second the motion, um, Dr. Brown, that having mentors of all backgrounds and all gender um, identifications is important, um, so we shouldn't be limiting, but we should engage everyone in the discussions that we're having because everyone can help us move the needle in the areas we're talking about tonight. I think that's a great point. There's a question that came up in the panel uh, box paralleling this, um, asking how do um, those of us mentoring avoid mentoring burnout? And um, this individual is the only female ortho within 100 miles who mentors, and so the demands are high. And I think we see that in some other programs that all the underrepresented and minority students are sent to Dr. Mason or um, Dr. Henderson. I don't know if you see that. How do you engage your colleagues to be allies? Or Dr. Samora is probably the main female mentor at Ohio State. <laughs> Any thoughts of how you uh, bring in a team to help with this important role? Um, I think it's important uh, to circle back with the with the term ally. And um, I recently uh, read a book called The Memo by Minda Harris, and she talked about being collaborative with your ally and rather reframing the 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 title as a success partner, so that your mentors. Um, are also your success partners, and they partner with you in creating spaces where there are no spaces, and using their privilege and using their access to um, empower you and help you move forward. So that's whether it's, it's color or race or ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation, I mean that there's really a role for all of us to be um, success partners in empowering those um, that come behind us. So, Don, Dr. Laporte, I'd like to comment on the, the question that uh, the viewer raised 
uh, the, the woman who's the only woman orthopedic surgeon in this large geographic area. First of all, God bless you, whoever you are out there. Thank you for being wherever you are out there and, and showing those young women that there are women who do orthopedics. Um, I empathize with, with the fact that you, you feel uh, that there's so many students who are seeking mentorship and there's only so much personal bandwidth that you have. And I think those of us that have been doing this for a while, I'm sure Dr. Mason, well, all, all of us on the panel, Dr. Henderson, you're the youngest one, so I'm, I'm uh, excluding you um, from this comment. Uh, but those of us that have been doing this for a while, I, I'll just say from my own personal experience, sometimes it can be a little, um, a little much because uh, you, know, you can see there's such need and, and these young women need mentorship and they need quality mentorship, right? They need people that are going to help them achieve the kind of, of experiences and products that are going to promote their success into getting into orthopedics and then being successful once they're in orthopedics. But none of us can do it all by ourselves. And that's why we have groups like the mentoring program at RJOS. And I suspect that BWOS, even though you just, Dr. Brown, even though you just formed yourselves, there'll be mentoring opportunities there. And so it, my suggestion for that scenario is to get those students to reach out to these other organizations where there are people, other women in particular, that can serve as mentors. Um, and and share the the joy and the opportunity to encourage more young women to pursue our profession because none of us can do it all alone. I think just another thing that COVID has taught us is that a lot of this can be done virtually, um, and so we're we're fortunate enough to live in the 21st century where you know we're having this panel and this conversation via uh, this platform currently. And so uh, you could outsource and like Dr. O'Connor said, and, and uh, find some people that are like-minded and interested. Um, and a lot of mentorship can happen via, you know, social media or, or, or via platforms such as Zoom, so. On the topic of Zoom, we are uh, rapidly approaching residency interviews uh, for the applicants uh, this cycle. And there were a couple questions that came from that end. So, um, one, um, what's the best way to address a program's lack of minorities or women during a residency interview process? Um, Dr. Samora, Dr. Henderson? Closest to the process? Or Dr. Brown? So uh, I, I think it's, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Brown. I was I was going to say that I I think probably during the interview process is may not be necessarily the appropriate time to ad address it. Uh, I don't know how you would phrase that in in a conversation um, in someone's office, but I think doing your research ahead of time is important. Um, and so if you should know about the the makeup of the faculty and of the residency classes, um, you you have a wealth of information um, at your at your disposal from from people that are in. The organizations like RJOS and BWOS that can tell you about, you know, where they went to school or, or where they trained and and uh, who who they know and and where they think um, uh, would be good places and good fits for you. Um, to look at it on the flip side is, um, it, you know, it's nice to be able to go somewhere where maybe it hasn't been uh, the most diverse uh, place and then go and be a stellar resident um, and do a phenomenal job and uh, and go ahead and blaze a path and, and bring someone behind you. Thank you, Julie. Dr. Samora. I think Dr. Henderson. I think Dr. Henderson nailed it on the head. Um, I do think if it's something that's really important to you, uh, I think it's a very reasonable question to ask at your interview. If you're the only un underrepresented minority or the only woman in the room, and nobody in the residency and nobody in the faculty looks like you, I think it's easy. I not easy. I think it's reasonable to ask, would someone like me fit in? Um, and, and to sort of gauge the opinion uh, 
the of the of the uh, interviewer and sort of get an idea of that gestalt. Uh, are they just kind of doing lip service, or do they really, really want to start being more diverse and inclusive? And I um, mean, it's 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 been shown that you know one begets another begets another, and so sometimes programs just have never been able to attract um, some different looking people, um, and so it. Uh, there are still programs out there that have never had a woman. There are even more programs that have never had underrepresented minorities. So it's um, that's the more common than not. Um, and I think it's a very reasonable question to ask. I agree. And most programs would be happy to connect you with um, if you know somebody who's gone through the program, who's got commonalities with you. Um, there may be an alumni uh, from the program or who's been faculty there. Um, and it's it's tough to be the first, but at least getting a feel for whether the program is open to that um, and that you're comfortable with um, their goals and their mission, uh, I think is really important. Um, there was a suggestion in the chat that I think is helpful. I wanted to throw that out there for mentors that are experiencing burnout. There, uh, especially with Zoom, there are resources through um, the Gladden Society and through the Perry Initiative and through RJOS uh, with mentoring committees um, and many people that are very dedicated to and interested in mentoring uh, to pair up some of these students with as well. Um, on the student uh, topic, there was also a question um, about hair. Do you feel pressured to wear wigs, weaves, or, or straighten your hair for ARAS photos or interviews um, or while at work? So I will open that up to Dr. Brown, uh, Dr. Henderson, Dr. Mason, to all. So I was very happy to see this question as one of the submitted questions. It's something that um, we kind of whisper in the background. Um, I think the final answer is to be comfortable with whatever you decide um, for your ERAS picture and however you'll appear for these Zoom interviews. Um, and so ideally, one shouldn't be concerned about whether you have braids or dreads or curly hair or kinky hair or weave or passion twists and all the different wonderful things that um, we can do with our hair. But we also need to be cognizant of the field that we're entering. And um, we've been saying the numbers. I mean, orthopedic 66% female. There are 25 roughly black female orthopedic residents in the entire country. And so, um, Sometimes I think you have to play the game so that you can move forward. And um, I think that there may, may even be a generational difference in this because um, it, it's funny, I, I was joking with uh, Dr. Laporte, I think it was last week that I was considering blowing my hair out to be professional for this webinar. And that really um, returns to these old um, internalized <laughs> oppressive statements about what is professional, what isn't professional, and with um, straight hair being professional. Um, and I think that looking at some of the younger generation, they have a very different um, interpretation of this, and that's, that's a movement in the, the right direction. What would you say, Dr. Henderson? Yeah, I, um, I think that your comments are, are, are spot on. Um, I was talking with Dr. O'Connor, who, who uh, it was at Yale when I was resident there, um, and I had long dreadlocks um, and at the time, and, and that was certainly uh, not the norm. Um, I think that being comfortable in, in in who you are and being able to present yourself in a professional manner is really important. Um, and and so if you feel like your most authentic self um, and you're able to uh, present yourself the best uh, with your hair and locks or with your with your weave or your sew-in or whatever you feel like is is best for you that's what you should do so dr laporte i want to share a story because i think um it i hope it will entertain the group and there'll be uh, a, a lesson in it a learning so this was years ago and i go in for surgery and i had a resident who was working with me and he was a white male resident and so I go in, it was a Monday morning, and he hasn't shaved, and he looks really scruffy. I mean, this was like, I mean, it looked to me unprofessional, okay? So I start by asking him if he's feeling all right. Yeah, he's feeling fine. Were you on call last night? No, I wasn't on call last night. 
are you growing a beard? No, I'm not growing a beard. Now, from my perspective, I've gone through in my head, like the rational arguments for why this young man didn't shave that morning. And now that they've come, I've come up with no rational explanation from him, I simply ask him, so you didn't shave this morning. Is there a reason why you didn't shave this morning? I just didn't feel like it was his response. So then I said, and how do you think Mrs. So-and-so, the first patient that we're gonna operate on, who happened to be an older woman, she was probably in her 80s. I said, how do you think she's going to feel when she looks up at you from the gurney? What is she going to think about you? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, let me put what I'm concerned she's gonna think about. She's gonna look at you and she's gonna say, is this young doctor who's assisting Dr. O'Connor with my surgery, is he really prepared to take care of me? Is, if he devotes this little attention to his own appearance, is that the kind of attention he's going to devote to him in the OR? And I said, so this is not the, the feeling of confidence in you or me, because you are a reflection of me that I want my patients to have. So you are excused until you go and shave and come back and present yourself in a professional manner to my patients who are our patients because you are part of my team. And so he was dismissed and he went and shaved and then he came back. So that's my professional appearance story. Because the reason why we, why do we want to look professional? Because we are doing it for our patients. We are doing it because we want our patients to be comfortable, that we have knowledge, that we are um, skilled, and that we can help them. And they need to believe in us. And they can believe in, it's, I believe, this is my bias, right? that they can believe in us easier when they see us appearing as professional. And I understand that the people's views and perspectives on that can change, and there can be generational differences in what one sees as professional. But I just wanna take it back to what is the reason why we're doing this? It's for our patients. So that's my professionalism story. I think, um that there's a distinct difference for sure between, you know, appearing disheveled um, and then just appearing to to have, you know, a variation of of the norm in terms of your hairstyle or such. And so I, you know, I would never advocate for anybody to to appear disheveled or, or unkept um, at work. But I think that um, part of part of and this is good that we're having this conversation, because part of part of what it is, is that when I walk in the door, there's a set of preconceived notions that are freak I'm frequently met with. You know, everybody has their implicit bias or their unconscious bias. And so patients are going to have preconceived notions about who I am and what my capabilities are. Um, and, and part of what I think is fun is, is proving them wrong or, or proving them right, you know, depending, depending upon what goes on. But um, I think that, you know, you have to accept the fact that you get you get the best me or my patients get the best Dr. Henderson when I'm when I'm most comfortable. Um, and so if, if I am presenting myself such as this with short hair and, uh, and such is, is, is where I, I feel the most comfortable and the, and the most like myself and the most uh, best prepared to uh, perform surgeries uh, to, the, to the greatest of my capability, then that's how I should, you know, that's how I should come uh, for the day. And, and I would, you know, never be unkept or, or unprofessional um, uh, in any way. And so um, I think patients definitely will have preconceived notions. Um, uh, but, but part of, part of this is, is that maybe by saturating the market with, with pictures, uh, uh, that don't always look like the norm, uh, those notions will change over time. And the five o'clock shadow is in Dr. O'Connor. <laughs> well, right. at 7 a.m. or at 6.30 in the morning in the pre-op holding, I'm just not sure that it was that in, but I agree. I agree, Dr. Henderson, with your comments. There's a difference between, you know, unkept and kind of disheveled and you know choosing your own unique or different hair a hairstyle that may not be 
you know, what everybody else is using, but that doesn't mean you're not, that someone's not neat and clean. And I, I link those very strongly with, you know, professionalism in terms of appearance, but it does, it does, you know, get into that question of through whose lens, right? Are we viewing the definition and term of professionalism? So that, that's just things to keep in mind as we navigate this really complicated world, right? Of balancing all of these competing interests, the perspective of the patient, the perspective of the surgeon, the care team. I mean, there's lots of competing interests in our world. Um, I wanted to jump in here that, um, again, it's who we're centering this term professionalism on. And I mean, even the example of a five o'clock shadow, um, again, it's centered on the majority of orthopedist hair, right? Meaning that um, black men who may have more kinky hair for their beard or more coiled hair, if they frequently shave their beard, they may develop ingrown hairs, which then become cysts and become very, can become unseemly. So perhaps a black male has decided to grow a very, very short beard because that is the best hair, right? That's the best styling of that hair for his, his hair type. And so for, the, for us to think of that as unprofessional or unkempt is again, a, a bias that we may have, um, we have to address because not everyone has um, perfectly straight hair that comes out of their skin for their beard and do, doesn't you know, develop and ingrown hair. So again, when we are um, becoming a more diverse community, we have to be aware of um, how we each have internalized the, um, these standards of professionalism. And I'm doing air quotes for professionalism. Yeah, I learned something very um, interesting and in, as a third year medical student shadowing Dr. Claudia Thomas when she was an attending at Johns Hopkins and uh, she wore a crown of braids. This was back in the 90s. Um, and um, one of her colleagues said to her, you know, Dr. Thomas, every time I see you, your hair is different. And she turned to that fellow attending um, who was a white male and said, well, you know, sir, you're, you're actually demonstrating your ignorance as to the versatility of African-American hairstyles. And this is how I show up to be confident. And excellent and so for her to be able to verbalize that in a place where she was completely self-assured and confident i think that's what we want from our um, young people um, this is you know it is a matter of professionalism but it's also a matter of cultural humility are we can we be humble enough to expand our definition and understanding of how people can present themselves in a way that is representative of who they are not diminishing of who they are but can we be open and inclusive of who they are, such as, you know, our students who, you know, choose to wear their hair curly or coily. You know, um, we have in one of our Black women physicians groups a saying that um, uh, natural hair will be considered more professional when more professional women wear their hair naturally. So how much more time do we have to spend in terms of meeting a definition of professionalism when, in fact, this is how my hair grows out of my head? You know, so would this be considered unprofessional or not, but in my, in, in my purview, in our expansion of this discussion, if it should allow for um, an additional expression of who, um, our, who our physician colleagues um, deem themselves to be, meeting the standards of professionalism and expanding what that looks like across all cultures, races, and ethnicities, to be more inclusive, to include, you know, one of our students, Dr. Dina Kashawi, and her, her job in the OR, you know, that was for a long time, people were required to take their job, to remove their job in order to operate. And she's been able to change a standard that allows her to honor her presentation, her religious beliefs and who she is, and that should extend to here too. I think this kind of discussion is so important to foster the confidence so that people can be, you know, be themselves and be, comfortable in this environment and that that's accepted. Um, Inky, there's a, actually a question that somebody sent in 
that I think parallels that. She said, I've been dismissed for advocating for a minority patient in the past. How do we deal with attendings who may penalize us for pointing out these injustices? So how do you um, facilitate the confidence to speak up or for people to bystanders to say something and advocate for what's right? Get back to what Dr. Mason said previously about being an ally. Um, maybe, you know, in our closing uh, section here, can everyone maybe weigh in on one um, point that you'd like to leave people with about uh, being an ally and helping foster uh, the kind of environment that, in, that welcomes and increases diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, I think it really depends on where you are in your stage of your career. I think advocating as a med student is very challenging. Advocating as a senior surgeon, much easier. Um, so I loved uh, hearing Dr. Mason's story that stayed with her 25 years later, um, because that's what we need in, in the allies, for, for allies to stand up for that situation. Um, certainly, as we become more senior, we become more comfortable in challenging those types of interactions. but um, it's hard when you're younger on because medicine is still such a hierarchical uh, structure still. So um, I think having those senior mentors that are allies is, is critically important to develop that culture of no tolerance. Thank you. Dr. Laporte, I just wanna make a comment to whoever uh, asked that question. And I would say that we know that life, unfortunately, is not fair and that our systems are not fair and just to the, some of them are, are really not fair and just and others still have more opportunities to improve. But please do not sacrifice yourself when you are early in your, in your journey, even though you see this wrong. And I know this might sound counterintuitive because obviously the right thing, the thing we all want to do is to stand up to every injustice that we can and speak out and be vocal to try and right a wrong. But I don't want that to be at the sacrifice of you um, being successful on your journey because we need more of you to, to be successful on the journey and you will be able to advocate more effectively when you're basically higher up the power structure, which is what Dr. Samora was referring to. So while I know it would be ideal for everyone to be able to always speak up, when you're the lowly medical student, you just may not be able to do that. And I hate saying that, but that's just the reality of some situations. And I would say you have to trust your gut, try and go to um, a more senior person and express your concerns. And, and then, you know, we all just, we, we commit to try and do better. I hope that doesn't sound like a cop-out, but I don't want um, young people to, to derail themselves, basically. I mean, I think you have to be strategic about when you are advocating for others and when you aren't. So, um, for example, it's more advantageous for you as a woman to continue on your path to becoming an orthopedic surgeon than it is to necessarily speak out about this one instance in this one clinic with this one senior resident or, um, or attending. And so you always have to weigh um, the risk-benefit ratio for this. Uh, what's important is that as we in our field begin and continue to have these difficult discussions, it's that those who are more senior, who do have the power, are able to leverage that power to decrease those incidences where people are saying things or acting inappropriately, whether it's um, because someone is a woman and saying a, a really offensive statement or whether, I recall when I was uh, interviewing for residency, some of the call rooms actually had um, explicit material in them and that was pretty standard. So we we have we each have a role in empowering those that are coming behind us, and that's that's um, that's incumbent on all of us. Thank you. 
Thank you for reading the last words, Don. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I, I just think it's important for everybody to recognize the, the value of mentorship in this in this situation and to help bring perspective to the lived experience of whatever a medical student might be going through. You know, we emphasize on a regular basis that we don't want you to do this alone. So whether you dial into any of the organizations that you've heard tonight, and that was that's one of the specific pillars of priority for um, the Black women orthopedic surgeons, as well as the other organizations that you've heard mentioned, that this is a situation where people have already paved the path. Um, and it's not that you won't encounter challenges, but there are people that can help you navigate in a way that you don't have to sacrifice yourself, but you can still use and own your voice so that you can move forward and maybe prevent what happened to you from happening to somewhere else, but you do have to understand that there's a procedure and strategy that should be followed and you get to decide for yourself whether you're going to say something, not say something, to be able to live with that decision moving forward. So I think that is one of the reasons why we emphasize mentoring um, and multi-generational mentoring as well, so you can get multiple perspectives and multiple input on you know, some of these critical uh, decisions that you'll be forced to make during your career. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Yeah, uh, I appreciated this conversation. I'm happy that everybody was able to be open and honest um, and wanted to echo what Dr. Uh, Mason said about mentorship. Um, certainly, you know, following her lead uh, in her, her program is what brought me to, you know, this panel. And so um, I think that everybody can do um, a little bit of something. I'm in private practice and, and, and have been able to find ways to reach out uh, to students uh, via the internet and, and as well as uh, not just MD students, but PA students. And so um, I think it's important that we we uh, increase our representation and stay visible um, so that everybody understands that that uh, becoming an orthopedic surgeon is a possibility. You're here. Thank you all for joining the panel tonight and thank you um, everyone in the audience for joining us tonight. I've learned a lot. It's an outstanding group. I think it's important to pay it forward and not just the mentorship but the sponsorship and helping upcoming students but also helping each other. Um, and I think uh, that will all move us forward uh, to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in orthopedics um, and beyond. And I hope you all join us for upcoming sessions. And we look forward to partnering uh, with BWOS uh, in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic job, Dr. Laporte. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thanks, great Dr. night. Thanks, Dr. Yes. LaPorte, Addison Mora, every panel. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for this wonderful but, panel. Yeah.